Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 100 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. My wife, Jean, lived with progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. I'm a past member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee, and currently I serve on the MS Society's Community Review of MS Research Committee. I'm a district activist leader and trustee for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to give us a place for the MS community to connect and to connect you with experts who are ready to answer your questions on the topics that people affected by MS ask and wonder about every day. Please feel free to post your comments and questions on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch. MS Navigators are online throughout today's program, answering those questions and connecting you to resources. People living with multiple sclerosis may actually hold the key to curing the disease. Donating brain and spinal cord tissue to MS research will help the scientific community understand what's driving the disease, what's driving disease progression. Joining us today to discuss the research being done at tissue banks and the importance of tissue donation is Dr. Claire Riley. Dr. Riley is the Karen L. K. Miller Associate Professor of Neurology at Columbia University Medical Center and is co-director of the Columbia University Multiple Sclerosis Center in New York. Dr. Riley is also a co-investigator at the National MS Brain Bank, where she directs the recruitment and characterization of participants in the study. Welcome, Dr. Riley, and thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much, John. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I just want to say I appreciate the work that you do for the MS community. Uh, you're really a resource uh, and a leader in communication, bringing us together. It's so valuable. Thanks so much. You know, I always like to start by getting our definitions in order. Can you tell us what tissue donation is and how it differs from whole body donation? Absolutely. Choosing to donate your brain, spinal cord, optic nerves and related tissues to MS research is really a targeted anatomical gift. Many people generously decide to become organ donors, for example, and there can be some misunderstanding. And so I think some people have the idea that, well, if organ donation can't be accomplished, maybe other tissues will be repurposed for research. That's really not the case. If you wanna donate your tissues to research, there has to be an explicit choice and a receiving tissue bank program like ours. Another option is whole body donation. For example, medical students um, like I or my colleagues have the privilege of learning anatomy through the process of dissection, and, and that's a whole body donation. So they're really pretty distinct. So what types of tissue are studied in MS, and how can this kind of work bring us closer to identifying cures? Most common donations are brain and spinal cord. We know these to be sort of the core tissues that are involved in multiple sclerosis, but our program also includes optic nerves, which are very commonly involved. We know optic neuritis to be a common presenting clinical syndrome in multiple sclerosis. We also study the meninges, the coverings of the brain, and cervical lymph nodes. And some of this is in response to requests that we've received at the bank as we've been growing and reflects a revolving understanding of MS pathophysiology. And I would say one of our core values at the National MS Brain Bank is to be nimble and responsive to our requesting investigators. Mm -hmm. So how can it bring us closer to cures? I mean, we're providing the material um, for scientists across the country, really across the world, to be able to test hypotheses, to, to link their ideas and their um, concepts to sort of the ground truth and what's happening in the tissue. The National MS Society has supported tissue banks for a long time. I'm hoping you can tell us about the National MS Brain Bank and how it's different from other tissue banks. There are several existing brain banks for multiple sclerosis in the United States and, and several across the world. 
um, including some that are supported by the National MS Society as we are. And we have certainly benefited tremendously from the advice and partnership um, from with those that have been involved in some of these existing banks. Particularly, I'll just um, point out John Corboy and his wonderful team at the Rocky Mountain MS Center and Tissue Bank. Um, our bank is different in a few ways from existing programs. Uh, the first is that we really do deep clinical phenotyping. What does that mean? We seek to enroll people into a prospective study of MS long before the end of life is even in view. And we wanna follow them prospectively to understand the disease over the coming years. We enroll people in this prospective study at a distance. We can enroll them locally in New York City, but more and more we're finding people from across the country that wanna be involved. And so we've developed a telehealth platform where we can collect cognitive information on people. We can send them an activity tracker to wear for a couple weeks every few years and solicit from them information about their disease through things like patient reported outcomes. And so we can really understand how the disease is impacting the person's life and their functioning over the years. And when that person comes to the end of his or her life, there's really a deep clinical phenotype to pair with the path pathology uh, with the tissue sample. Many tissue banks for MS and for many diseases have really limited clinical information. And, you know, when I think about MS, and I, I imagine this is true for our listeners today, one of the really striking features of the disease is how heterogeneous it is. You know, some people are really profoundly impacted, some become rapidly disabled, and others minimally so, uh, and the whole range in between. And so I think understanding that clinical profile and matching it with the pathology is really key. So the second difference about our bank is that we have the ability to do molecular profiling. So when we receive tissue, um, it's removed quickly within 24 hours and then shipped overnight um, for rapid processing at our brain bank hub in New York. Upon arrival at the tissue bank, the tissue is frozen. And from that frozen tissue, we can do advanced molecular profiling or other investigations as requested by investigators. A third novel aspect is our postmortem imaging. So after about two weeks in fixative, a hemisphere or half of the brain is sent to the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, where one of our PIs, Dr. Daniel Reich, um, in his lab, the, the brain undergoes high field imaging overnight. These images are truly stunning. They're very detailed, and we have the luxury of being able to do a long scan time at high field strength. Um, and of course, the subject matter is very still. Um, so this really allows us to capture very, very detailed images of the brain. And then when that hemisphere returns to us, um, we then perform histology and section the brain. And we can see the lesions that are apparent to the, to the naked eye, but we can also use the MRI to correlate with the pathology and find these lesions that are not visibly apparent. Um, and so we then construct a map where you can relate the lesions that are seen on MRI with the pathology or radiopathologic correlation. Um, and so we really seek to meld these things together and have clinical radiographic and pathologic correlation. And these uh, postmortem images, I think are really something that makes our brain bank unique. Um, and I'll just say the histology is done at Yale in the laboratory of Dr. David Pitt. Um, and then those images are digitized and can be linked to the, to the images from the postmortem MRI. So some complexity, a lot of moving parts, but I think it really does um, show the creativity and the thinking um, of, of our team. And it's something I'm very proud of. A moment ago, I heard you acknowledge Dr. Corboy and the Tissue Bank at the uh, University of Colorado. How does the National MS Brain Bank work with existing tissue banks? We've collaborated extensively with the Rocky Mountain Group, um, particularly. So donors who have registered with their bank have been frequently referred to us. Uh, since our standard operating procedures allow us to collect tissue from a broad geographic catchment area. Um, and we also seek to enroll people that are planning to donate through Rocky Mountain or wherever um, are welcome 
if their planned donation site isn't able to accept their brain from wherever they're living, um, we're happy to enroll people into our prospective study so that we can really accomplish that goal of the deep clinical phenotyping. You're currently working on the MS snapshot study. What can you tell us about this study? So we've been really liberal about accepting donations from essentially all individuals uh, with MS or, or healthy people um, who care about MS uh, who've wanted to donate to us thus far. But our eventual model is to require that you come in through the snapshot study as a precondition of donating to the bank. And again, that's because the clinical information is so critical to understanding the disease and we think really solving the, the puzzle that is MS. Uh, we know MS to be so heterogeneous. And um, with some people, you know, the, the progression is so gradual that it's almost imperceptible. Some people, it's, it's rapid and profound decline. Um, and so we really want to link the clinical information with the pathology. Um, I think that cognition is something that's really been under appreciated and cognitive impairment is so important to quality of life for people with MS. Um, and so I really um, look to that part of Snapshot as sort of a um, guiding concept. So Snapshot is a prospective study. It captures the clinical features of MS and really gathers treatment information as well as comorbidities, other historical information, um, information about risk factors, and habits, and it all incorporates into this deep clinical phenotype. What does it mean practically to be an MS snapshot? It means having about a 20 or 30 minute online telehealth visit with a study team member and completing several questionnaires once a year, and also wearing an activity monitor on your wrist for about two weeks every three to five years. Um, and it's, I would say, you know, it's certainly a commitment, um, but we have tried to design the protocol so that it's not an overbearing one. I'm glad you mentioned cognition. I know your work at the MS Brain Bank uses tissue to study aging in MS, specifically how aging may impact cognition among people living with MS. Can you tell us about that work and what you're hoping to better understand? I think this is so critical, John, you know, that given all these recent advances in MS therapies, and we think about this revolution and being able to treat especially inflammatory aspects of MS, we've seen the life expectancy, thankfully, improve. Um, and with so many people being able to take advantage of these types of treatments. I think now we have the luxury of thinking more critically about aging with MS. Uh, you know, Columbia, where, where I am on the faculty, has a long history of outstanding scientific work in Alzheimer's disease. And I'll particularly mention my co-director of the MS Center and our division chief, uh, Philip Yeager. He's one of the PIs of the Brain Bank and has really been a leader in understanding the role of inflammatory cells like microglia in both disease states. So we're certainly very interested in this in multiple sclerosis, but uh, microglia clearly have an important role in the development of pathologies of aging. So there's sort of a natural fit that has led me to this place. And as a clinician caring for lots of people with MS over the better part of two decades now, I think that cognitive changes are under-recognized um, and, and I want to learn more about them, about the cognitive patterns that suggest particular pathologies or disease processes in the brain um, and how to serve our patients better. I think this is particularly true now that Alzheimer is becoming a treatable disease. There's really a clinical imperative to understand and distinguish between different types of cognitive impairment in a person with a known MS diagnosis. We shouldn't just chalk it all up to MS. We have to investigate. And separately, you know, there are shared risk factors and potentially shared pathophysiologic mechanisms between MS and AD and, and perhaps other pathologies of aging. And I, I have a hope and an, and an inkling that understanding each disease um, and how they relate to each other will shed some light on their underpinnings and potential treatments. The National MS Brain Bank website includes a hero wall. Tell me about that. One thing that really drew me to, to medicine in the first place, to neurology and then to multiple sclerosis and neuroimmunology is 
the importance of the narrative, you know, the story of the person. And I can say building this resource and, and being part of the project has allowed me to turn some attention to this. Um, and it's just been amazing. We've received poems and artwork and other kinds of creative expression from, from individuals and their family members. Um, some of them are so, you know, intimate, you really feel like you know the person. It's really a privilege um, to be able to, you know, hold this position. And, you know, there are so many inspiring individuals who are involved in the project. I, I'm really humbled by it. I hope that people read the Hero Wall, you know, as it grows. We have quite a few kind of that are um, in, in the process now. Um, and we can really celebrate these amazing gifts that we've received from our donors. Um, it's such a privilege really to sit with the family members. Um, and one of the things that strikes me is <clears throat> just the, the relationships and you know, the people who are telling the tale. And um, I'm really, it inspires me to, you know, just continue to strive towards more effective treatments and towards cure, uh, be it through this project or others that I'm involved in. Uh, I think that making the decision to join your, your brain is a really brave one. I'm really inspired by those who make the decision to donate their brains to research. On a personal note, a cousin of mine, his name is James, uh, suffered from mental illness and he very, very sadly died from suicide this last year. One of his wishes uh, was to donate his brain to research on schizophrenia and mental illness and his family carried out that wish. And I found him to be so brave, you know, even as a young man of 27, he wasn't able to survive his illness, but he was able to do good for other people. Um, you know, different setting, different situation. But I, I think that it's really very impressive to see people making this choice. Um, and another thing that I have been struck by is just how much gratitude our families have that we're able to receive the donation. I think that some have had the experience, you know, when their loved one wanted to, to make this plan of having a hard time finding a bank that would be able to receive their tissue. Um, and, and that's, you know, among the last wishes of your loved one, you want to fulfill it. So I feel happy that we're able to, to meet that need for people. We heard from Sandy, who's curious about the process of donating her tissue after she dies. Can you explain how that works? Sure. And we actually made an animation um, that's up on our website to help describe the process. You can find it under the How It Works tab. Um, I'm guessing you might link to in your show notes. But the logistics are these. Um, when a person is registered um, with MS Snapshot and enrolled in MS Snapshot, we keep an eye on where everybody is, essentially. And we maintain a network of technicians that can help us with tissue retrievals across the country. Um, I can't say we have every you know, square mile of the country covered, but um, it's, it's a process and we continue to, to strive towards that. Um, we tend to make arrangements in the weeks or days when we know that a death is imminent um, or near. And that arrangement includes a plan to transport the remains to a location where the tissue removal can take place. This could be at a funeral home or at a medical center. It depends to some extent on state-by-state -state regulations. Um, but the tissue removal has to be done quickly. So within 24 hours of death, uh, the removal is done all posteriorly, so from behind. Um, and in this way, if a viewing is planned or, or awake with an open casket, there's no visible sign that the tissue donation has taken place. Crystal tells us that she wants to donate her brain to MS research to further research advancements. She knows it could be stressful for her daughter to follow through with the donation after Crystal passes. What can Crystal do to make this process as easy as possible for her daughter? I think a really important part of the process of brain donation is making your family actually a part of the plan. You know, the next of kin is included as a co-signer on the intent to donate document. And through that, process can learn about brain donation and the logistics of it 
as well as you know the goals of the project. Um, and we can help to to some extent to facilitate a conversation between the person who wishes to donate and and the next of kin. Um, that's something that I'm happy to be a part of. You know, we have um, a great team here, and we're happy to engage with families in those conversations as needed. Daryl says that he's really passionate about the idea that donating his brain and tissue to MS research could ultimately contribute to better treatments. He's wondering what, if any, cost is involved for him or his family. There should be no cost to the family. Uh, our project is funded by the National MS Society, and as part of our budget, uh, we cover the removal of the tissue and transportation. Uh, the family will receive eventually um, an official brain autopsy report. Um, our autopsy coordinators take on logistical burden of making the arrangements. And the only thing to do is shortly after the donor passes is for the next of kin to provide a verbal consent over the phone. And if the person was not involved in MS Snapshot already, we might ask that next of kin to help us gather some medical records and things like MR imaging on CD. Um, after the removal is complete, then the remains are returned to the funeral home or to the medical center for burial or cremation or whatever the family had planned. Roseanne tells us she doesn't live near an MS tissue bank, and she wants to know whether she's still eligible to donate, and if so, is the process different for her because of her location? You know, we try to make a pre-plan with all of our intended donors and identify a, a location and a technician who can do a removal in the local area. Beyond that, we have couriers that can transport tissue from point to point across the country. Um, so we can generally make a donation happen. I can't say we've done it um, in every state in the union yet, but um, we've certainly covered a pretty broad geographic swath. Um, so essentially the enrollment in MS Snapshot would be the same. We can um, really achieve everything remotely. Um, and just if somebody happens to live in a particularly remote area, it might just take a little bit more work on our end to identify a technician who can do the removal, but that's what we're here for. You know, some of the people watching us today are wondering how to become a tissue donor for MS Research. So what are the first steps to take if someone is interested in learning more? I think that the best resource is probably going to our website, uh, msbraindonation.org. Uh, you can also get to that through the National MS Society Tissue Bank page. Um, and that should take you through the steps, um, specifically enrolling in the MS Snapshot Prospective Study. And when that enrollment is complete, then you're provided with the intent to donate form. And that conversation can happen with your family member next of kin um, and one of the members of our team if you choose. Um, and that really starts the ball rolling. People who have family members or themselves are near the end of their lives and, and uh, feel that you know, this may be an imminent issue um, can certainly contact us directly either via email or there's a phone number. Um, and so if, if, if time is of the essence, we can be reached uh, more rapidly. Well, I wanna thank you for sharing some really important information that many of our viewers may not have been thinking about what would you say are the top three takeaways that you'd like our viewers to remember? Consider becoming an MS Snapshot participant and declaring your intent to donate your brain and other tissues to MS Research. Talk to your family and friends, those with or without MS, to consider tissue donation to help end MS and other neurologic disorders. And lastly, I would say spread the word far and wide. You know, social media has such incredible power and reach. Our target enrollment in MS Snapshot is 5,000 people with MS. And that's a big number. We're not there yet. Um, personally, I'm very happy to join a support group meeting or other patient or community events to help share information, educate people about the power of brain donation. So you can email me and contact me through the website. Um, and, and consider just spreading the word and amplifying this message. 
Well, I want to thank everyone who submitted some excellent questions, and thank you, Dr. Riley, for being with us today. That's my pleasure. Thank you. Before we close, I want to remind you that the National MS Society's MS Navigator Team is your best partner when it comes to connecting you to the very best information and resources on living with MS. You can reach an MS Navigator by phone, email, or through the Society's website by chat. For information and resources on MS, please be sure to visit the Society's website. You'll find research updates and news, information on connection programs like self-help groups. You'll hear about ways that you can get involved, and you'll find out about upcoming events that are taking place near you. Remember, you can connect with the National MS Society and others affected by MS on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And I hope you'll join me every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, where I continue the conversation that we start here. You'll find Real Talk MS at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. I'd like to thank Dr. Riley for joining us today. Please remember that a recording of this webcast will be available at the Society's website, at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. I hope you'll join us at this same time for next week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. You can always find our upcoming program topics on the National MS Society's website. And now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webcast is important. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to a survey pinned to the comments section. On YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. And on Twitch, you can find that link in the chat. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve, and it helps shape future programs. The survey takes just one minute, so I hope you'll take a minute to fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Claire Riley and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.